Griff! <laughs> Welcome back. Where are you pointing? Let's get you set up right. Is that right? Okay. It's Sunday. This beer is ready for getting into the keg. And in uh, the case of kegging, we're going to be using the uh, Fermona King Junior. Um, I will be fermenting in this at some point, but this is like a, a smaller fermenter than I'm used to. So what I thought I'd do is, to get, get it used, is um, we're going to keg into it. And then I can see the levels as we're racking. Now, when I put this video out, I had a lot of comments about people saying that when I'm using the keg down here, oh, not that one, that one's full, full of cleaner. Um, then a way of working out how much is going in is to measure it, measure the weight as the beer is flowing in. Work out how much like 19 litres or whatever is in the fermenter weighs and then monitor the weight as it's going in. Yes, of course. We will be doing that when we're filling up the kegs, but for this video we don't need to measure the, the weight, we can see it going in. I had another comment about um, the light. Uh, will the light affect it? We're, we're going to be putting it obviously back into the, the keyser and when it's in there it's dark. Okay, So you only get light in there once the, uh, the lid's open and the same goes for the, um, the fermenter. The fermenter that we're using, the snub nose from Keg King, is clear and of course if that was out uh, in the brewery then you'd be getting light strike on it unless you've covered it over with a jacket but because it's inside the keyser, it's completely dark in there. So I'm not worried about light strike there, and I'm not really that concerned about light strike while we're racking it, because as soon as we've racked it, it's going back into the keyser. So, what I did yesterday, today's Sunday, I must admit I've had a couple of bevies, alright? I've been out to the pub. This, what could possibly go wrong? I've no idea. Um, in fact, I've got another drink somewhere else. I don't know where I put it. We're going to rack this into this, this keg. I've lost my train of thought. Um, and then we're going we're gonna to do a sneak peek like we used to do. Yesterday was Saturday, obviously. We ran some caustic through this to get it clean. And then once the caustic was in there doing its thing, we then ran the caustic through, through the, um, the liquid to liquid line, which is what we're going to be using to do a close transfer from fermenter to this. So this has had caustic through it and then everything was rinsed out and star sand rinsed through it as well. In fact it's still got star sand in it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a keg to run the remainder of the star sand out of the fermenter King Junior through here and into the keg. That will get rid of the star sand and then we're going to fill this up to 10 psi, put the spawning valve on here, release the pressure a little bit so that we can then use the 10 psi that's in the fermenter to run into the fermenter King Junior. It's been a long time since I've done it but hopefully it'll work out. Before we get a racked because what we did yesterday as well is we crash chilled the beer. I've set it at, we set it at 2.9 degrees, uh, so it's 3.5 and chilling. Of course the, the freezer section is on and you can see that the, the Krausen's dropped, everything's dropped out and the Massive advantage to pressure fermenting is that I'd get to this point of crash chilling where, like if I was using a, a standard homebrew bucket, which, which I used to use with the airlock, is that once you crash chilling, obviously it starts to suck everything through the airlock. And years ago, I even emptied like a, a full container of star sand that was my airlock because I had the blow off tube going into it. Of course, crash chilled and it sucked the whole thing into it. 
So then, in the past, I had to take the blow-off out and try and seal the bung hole up. Oh, bung hole! Because I didn't want anything being sucked in from the, the change of pressures when it crashed chilling. Of course, I don't have to worry about that now. So, the pressure has dropped here because um, the CO2 in the headspace has been absorbed into the cold beer like that, which is looking lovely. So, there's been no oxygen or anything sucked in to there. Oh, don't mind this, fellas. Don't mind this. Hey. Hey. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Coconut. Fellas, it looks like we've got a New England IPA! We're done. If I wasn't filming the process, then I've, I would have had the keg in the fermenter with the lid closed, especially using the uh, the clear plastic. And then we're definitely not going to get any light strike on it. But for the purpose of the video and showing it here, we had to do it that way. We are just left with the trub, the the hop, and the yeast at the bottom of this fermenter but otherwise a nice full keg. It's, uh, it's done its work again. I'm very, very pleased with this snub nose. Just look at that, eh? Just look at that. Just wants emptying and a nice caustic wash. And then when we've done that, we can run the, uh, the caustic through, through the, uh, the transfer hose to get that a good clear out. All that's left to do now is go for a snake peak. Friggin' rights. Fellas, here we go. I've actually got the room to get you in front of me while the kit's behind me, which is fantastic, but uh, here we go. A sneak peek of the Idaho 7 American Pale Ale, which has turned into a New England IPA um, on appearance anyway, so shall we, shall we have a sniff at it? First time in three years having a beer on tap. Smells amazing. It smells very fruity and orangey, tropical nose to it, and a very light malt coming through. Anyway, cheers, fellas. It's been a long time coming, but thanks for sticking with me. 
Here we go, sneak peek, Idaho 7, American Pale Ale. Subscribe to he was out of the video and I hope to see until next time. I'm already.